So let's start the day with a short Dhamma reflection and then I want us to do some meditation together. Um, and of course anything that I suggest in the meditation, any of the guidance that is offered is entirely um, an invitation only, it's a suggestion for your practice. So f- please feel free to pick up anything that's helpful and to leave aside anything that's not and just continue to practice in the way that you normally would. Um, but as I said, my emphasis tends to be on our approach to practice and approaching it um, using the right intentions of loving kindness towards whatever we experience. So loving kindness is not only a practice we do towards others or towards ourselves as human beings, but it can be a practice that we um, use as a way of looking, as a way of perceiving whatever arises in our body or mind. And so when we infuse our awareness with loving kindness, it tends to strengthen mindfulness and also has this beautiful antidote within it um, to overcome ill will, any kind of uh, negativity or um, resistance, irritation, even just the hardness of the mind that finds it difficult to receive the breath. So this loving kindness, when it's used as an aspect of mindfulness, it's infused into the way you look, the way you regard the world. It can be a very beautiful, powerful tool. Um, And today I wanted to talk, because it is Vesak Day, it's the full moon of May, which is traditionally regarded as the Buddha's birth, day of enlightenment, and also final passing into Parinibbana, into complete cessation. Um, the highest bliss of Nibbana. Um, I wanted to talk about how we can use confidence, inspired confidence, faith if you like, to help again deepen and fuel our practice. So confidence is used to uplift the heart, to gladden the mind and also to soften our heart in preparation for the meditation so that we don't just come to our cushion kind of with all the remnants of whatever's happened during the day and the grumpiness or the tiredness, but we do something to refresh our mind, first of all, and kind of incline it in the right direction. And the Buddha said that sukhino chitam samadhyati, that means in Pali, um, samadhi or stillness, sometimes translated as concentration, but I much prefer stillness, which has this warmth, aspect of warmth and stilling and settling. The proximate cause for that is happiness, is gladness, is joy. Sukhi, sukhino chitam samadhyati. So a happy mind becomes stilled. And it's important to know what that happiness is. You know, how are we, um, where and how are we looking for happiness? Because there are types of happiness that don't lead to freedom from suffering, that just increase our dependency on sensual pleasures, on um, you know, worldly pleasures that actually can increase grasping, wanting, craving in the mind. And there are other kinds of happiness that are much purer, much more noble, much more lofty, if you like, um, and that have the benefit of ourselves and others at heart, that really do conduce to beautiful, peaceful, joyful states of mind that we can rely on, that we don't need to be afraid of, um, that are more sustaining, more nourishing for our heart and for our mind. And so sadha, confidence, sometimes translated as faith, um, is one of the five indriyas. And the five indriyas are known as the strengths or the powers of the mind. They're sometimes translated as the five spiritual friends or the five spiritual faculties. And confidence, sadha, is the first of those. The second is energy. And the third is mindfulness. And that energy and mindfulness, they kind of roll around confidence, trust. So when we have confidence in something, it gives us energy. It gives us the inspiration, the motivation to want to take the first step. Yeah. So our mind becomes energized. And when the mind's energized, it becomes brighter. It's more mindful. It's more able to see things clearly. So these three qualities really feed into each other, the confidence empowering the energy, the energy empowering the mindfulness so that we're more fully aware of whatever's arising for us in life or in our mind. And then, of course, the result of that, the next two indriyas are samadhi, again, stillness, and wisdom. So from samadhi, from stillness, when the, the mind is free from hindrances, we have a chance to see deeply into the nature of things. 
So we get this inspiration, as I said, with something that's really worth being inspired in, something uplifting for the mind. And then it can help us to get the sequence of something called dependent liberation going. And dependent liberation is basically this beautiful sequence that takes us from suffering all the way through to liberation. And the second factor of that is confidence, sadha. So the path sometimes for many of us starts with a sense of suffering, a sense of something not being quite right. It might be, you know, something that happens in your life that really feels like bereavement or some kind of intense trauma that's very obviously raw suffering. But suffering can also mean, the word dukkha, can also mean a sense that there's something missing, you know, you're looking for a certain meaning in life that you're not able to find in the sensory world. You know, the things in our society that we're told to kind of seek after, to go after, can bring us a certain amount of happiness and fulfilment for a while, but they're all subject to change. You know, even the best of relationships has to end in a parting, if not in your lifetime. You know, if even if you have a wonderful relationship and nothing goes wrong, still... You know, at the time of death, we'll have to say goodbye to all those things we hold dear and that we love. And an appreciation of this can be the first um, proximate cause for confidence to arise because we hear the Dhamma teachings, we hear that there's a path that leads beyond um, suffering to a real, sustainable, lasting joy that comes from deep within inside. Yeah? And from that confidence, the sequence of dependent liberation starts. And the Buddha said it's something that happens naturally. From confidence, joy arises in the mind, gladness arises in the mind. From that gladness, pamoja, joy, uh, piti arises. Piti is like rapture or bliss in meditation, a kind of happiness of inspiration again. And that helps us stay with our meditation object. Yeah? We enjoy being with the breath. It's pleasant, it's pleasurable. We feel like the mind's energies are starting to collect and the mindfulness is brightening up. And from there, the mind starts to become tranquil, pasadi, the next in the sequence. It starts to still, become quiet, and we find ourselves able to sit for longer periods of time. And from there, we get this sukha, this deep, contented happiness. You may have experienced it from time to time in meditation or in life maybe sitting in nature, under a tree, and you just feel this real sense of ease and contentment for no particular external reason other than a kind of deep feeling of wellness inside. And it's, of course, usually the result of living a good life, living a virtuous life, having confidence in the path, and knowing that your, your life is inclining in a good direction. And as a result of that kind of happiness, samadhi arises. Yeah, stillness of the mind, the deep meditations of jhanas. And that samadhi becomes a cause for seeing things as they truly are, yata bhuta jnana dasana, because at that point the hindrances have been cleared from the mind. And one of the reasons, of course, is that sada is a direct antidote to the hindrance of doubt, yeah? the kind of sceptical, crippling doubt that doesn't allow us to take a first step. But sada, it's important to understand that confidence is not a kind of blind faith in anything, in any being or in any concept of Dhamma, you know, even in enlightenment. There can be a confidence that such states of mind do exist, but we're not expected to take anything on faith. The Buddha's invitation is always to come and see for yourself, to come and find out, does this path work or not? And the kind of confidence that the Buddha talks about, it does have an emotional element. It does have an aspect of devotion, an aspect of even love, reverence, you know, reverence for the qualities of a Buddha, for his peace, for his serenity, his great compassion and wisdom. You know, there can be a real sense of like holding something up in our mind to the heart that kind of invites a sense of awe and inspiration that we too want to follow that path. We too want to cultivate such beautiful qualities within ourselves. And that can be incredibly inspiring, you know, and actually just by recollecting those qualities, we can start to feel them developing in ourselves. Whenever we see kindness in another or generosity, something really special like selfless giving, Something stirs inside and we recognise, yes, I value this, you know, I value this too. And the only reason you can value it is because you do have some of that within yourself. 
Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to recognize it in another. So we hold up these things to our, in our heart. We revere them with a sense of um, reverence, a sense of um, devotion, even love. But the faith also has an intellectual element, and it has to go hand in hand with that. We use our rationality, we use our discernment you know, to take those steps, but to ask ourselves all along the way, is this really leading to my own benefit? and to others' benefit as well. If it is, then it's worth continuing. If not, then you may have to reconsider. Yeah. And the Buddha said that we can have hypotheses, we can have a kind of inclination that, yes, maybe there is such a thing as enlightenment, maybe there is such a thing as past or future lives, maybe karma is real, that the quality of our intention you know, does um, feed into acts of body and speech that will have effects, that will have consequences for ourselves and others. Um, we can hold these things as hypotheses, but we shouldn't make a definite conclusion. He actually said, you know, a wise person who preserves the truth does not come to a definite conclusion, only this is true and everything else is wrong, when as yet there is no discovery of truth. So this kind of confidence should be the confidence that enables us to start the journey. And in the beginning, it's kind of provisional. We say, OK, let me see. And after a while, when we get the results, it becomes verified. And eventually it becomes unshakable when we actually start to experience the things that the Buddha experienced. Start to see that greed, hatred and delusion in our hearts are actually being undermined. We're not reacting with the same intensity of anger or ill will. We're not um, grasping in the same way or longing in the same way for material things or sensual pleasures. We're starting to get this kind of inner happiness through our own virtuous life. And so it starts to become verified and eventually unshakable when we reach stream entry, the first stage of enlightenment. And then it becomes a real force, a real power and a guidance in our mind. So reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, you know, the Buddha is one of the three refuges. How is the Buddha a refuge for us? Do we take refuge in the Buddha as a person? Or do we take refuge in those qualities, those same qualities that can be cultivated within ourselves? And I think, you know, the Buddha is a real human being. He is definitely a person, a real person, just as we are, who had struggles just as we do. He, there's even suttas in the um, Pali Canon that talk about his own struggles with unwholesome thoughts. He had thoughts of cruelty arising, thoughts of ill will arising, of course, before he was fully liberated. And that was in his final life. You know, he wasn't some kind of superhuman that had qualities that we don't have. He was just like us. He struggled in the same ways. But at the same time, he obviously had practiced for many, many lives and developed these incredible faculties of mind. So we can take inspiration from him, but also we can take guidance and direction because the Buddha is also known as the great physician, you know, who diagnoses our disease. He says, OK, this is how you suffer and why you suffer. And here is a path. Here is a path that you can walk on to come out of that same suffering. So he's the great physician in that he shows us, you know, the path, the medicine, if you like. But we have to take that medicine. The Buddha can't take that medicine for us. You know, he can only show us the way and we have to walk on that path. So the first thing that we take refuge in, if you like, is his awakening, right? And that the same capacity for awakening that we have within our heart. Yeah, we have the same capacity to wake up to the Four Noble Truths, to suffering, to the cause of suffering, and to the path out of suffering, the fact that there is a path to the end of all discontent. Yeah? And we take refuge in his awakening as an arahat. So this is the first quality of a Buddha. Arahat means fully enlightened. And our hat literally means one who has destroyed greed, hatred and delusion. And Bhikkhu Bodhi, one of the Pali scholars who's translated all the uh, Pali texts, he says that we can see this um, destruction of the defilements in three ways. That the, de that the um, destruction is total in that there are none left at all. There's no greed, aversion or delusion left at all. That it's completely uprooted from the root and that it's finally uprooted to the extent that it cannot re-arise. 
So if you imagine a Buddha without these qualities, he's completely incapable of any harmful thought, of any harmful deed. He's completely incapable of acts of body and speech that can cause suffering for others. Imagine the peace and the harmlessness of such a being, to be in their presence and to feel so completely safe, so completely unjudged. You know, the great power, the great serenity, the great equanimity, and yet this gentleness that's just so harmless, that brings all kinds of beings towards him for the teachings. And he would teach, you know, the kings of the time, virtuous and unvirtuous kings, political leaders. He would teach prostitutes. He would teach women who had just lost their child and would come running to him naked in the street, you know, begging for help, begging for advice. He would teach monastics, he would teach the the monks and the nuns and give them equality in terms of ordination. But he would equally serve the lay community, you know, and take a special effort to go out there and to um, receive food from the lay community. He even intercepted a mass murderer one time. He went out specifically to find this person and to stop him doing more harm. So everybody would be drawn to the Buddha. He would survey the world with his divine eye and kind of go to where he was needed. Um, And yet he was, you know, almost indistinguishable from any other monk. And there are stories in the suttas that make that very clear, that even though there are other stories that elaborate these kind of 32 marks of the great monk with long ears and the kind of thing on the head, actually I think that's later additions because there are other suttas where people didn't even know they were in the presence of the Buddha. They thought it was just another monk until they started to realise there's something going on here. You know, he's meditating deeply. He's got this aura about him of compassion and kindness and deep peace. And then they'd realise, oh my goodness, this I'm with the Buddha right now. <laughs> and imagine the inspiration when you realise you've been meditating with the Buddha without realising it. Wow. <laughs> really amazing. And another really incredible quality of the Buddha is called Vidya Charana Sampano. It means one who is perfected in wisdom, but also in conduct, in virtue. And I think this is very important, you know, especially when we look for teachers or we want to understand who is really wise. There should be an integrity there between their wisdom, what they speak about, and the way they actually live. We're not looking for perfect people. We're not looking for someone who never gets irritated or tired. But we are looking for someone who is virtuous, who doesn't breach the precepts, who holds those precepts as sacred, even when they're really developed at the cost of their life. They're not going to harm another living being. You know, they, they cannot take the life. They're not going to lie or deceive. You know, they're going to be trustworthy in relationships. They won't cheat. They won't use their sexuality in harmful ways. You know, they're not going to be taking intoxicants. Sometimes there's this crazy wisdom, you know, these so-called enlightened teachers who are still alcoholics. It's like they might have some catchphrases, some wise things to say, but how is it affecting their life? What is the point of wisdom if it doesn't lead to a beautiful virtue, um, to beautiful kindness, non-harm? And to benefit for oneself and all other beings, what's the point of that? You know, that makes no sense to say you're enlightened if you've still got anger and hate. You know, it totally undermines the whole point of enlightenment, which is to be completely free of these things. And the Buddha, you know, sometimes people say, well, if there's no craving left, if there's no wanting left, how can he continue to exist? But basically, the whole of their motivation is aligned to the Brahma Viharas. They're fueled, they're powered, if you like, by loving kindness, compassion, mudita, joy, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And that is what keeps them going. They serve, they teach tirelessly, selflessly, just out of these beautiful qualities, without expecting anything for themselves. The Buddha was teaching until his last breath. People were lining up to come and see him as he was on his deathbed. And his secretary, Venerable Ananda, actually said, you know, Stop, stop, you know, the Buddha is taking his last breath. Please, you know, he can't take your question. And the Buddha overheard that and said, let them come to me, Ananda. They need to hear the Dhamma. Let them come. It's just so beautiful. It makes almost tears well up in my heart because I know how hard it can be sometimes to continue serving when I'm tired, you know, when I'm um, struggling myself. And to think of a Buddha who is just able to completely put aside his own discomfort, his own distress, and serve from this heart of selflessness. Because he really has no more wishes in this world, other than to be of benefit for others. 
And he said, you know, I'm not going to pass away. I won't take my last breath until I've established the Sangha, the fourfold assembly of bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, monks and nuns equally, laymen, laywomen. And of course, today that would include anyone else of any gender identity. It doesn't matter. Any human being, until they're strongly established in the Dhamma, I will not pass away. And why are we here today? We're here today because of him, because the Buddha taught for us. He taught for future generations. He knew there would be people with little dust in their eyes who were capable of hearing the Dhamma, who were thirsty for the Dhamma, and who would, whose hearts would rejoice in hearing that there really is a path. So the Buddha is our teacher. You know, He had us in mind when he taught. He made sure that he stayed. He taught for 45 years and didn't pass away until there was enough of an assembly established that they could continue taking those teachings forward. And what are those teachings? What is our inheritance from the Buddha? It's so simple. Basically, continue doing virtuous deeds, practice virtuous deeds, abstain from unwholesome actions and keep on purifying the mind. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas, that's what he said. This is the teaching in a nutshell. Yeah. And how can you know that it's the Dhamma? How can you know that it's the Vinaya, the code of discipline for the monks and nuns? It's very simple again. He said anything you can know is the Dhamma if it leads to turning away from the world. And that really means turning away from the world of suffering, turning away from the path of suffering towards the path of peace, to dispassion, to fading, again, to finding that joy, that happiness within, to niroda, cessation, to the ending of things, the ending of greed, hatred and delusion, the ending of suffering, the ending of delusion, mm-hmm. to upasama, peace, deep peace, the deep peace of the jhanas, the deep meditation, and of course the peace of enlightenment as well. When there's nothing more to want, there's pure contentment, fulfillment, you've done what had to be done. To abhinya, direct knowledge, direct insight into the way things are. To sambodhi, enlightenment, and to nibbana the ending of things, the highest bliss that's possible for a human being just like us. And so we're on this path, to whatever extent we might think we're on it, we have some confidence, that's why we're here, that's why we know it's good for us to close our eyes and sit and look inside. And so I'd like us to meditate together today, just recollecting on these virtues to see if they can bring some happiness to mind and, um, and see how that can inspire your practice recognizing that yes you do have the qualities the latent qualities perhaps of a buddha within your heart and those can be developed and cultivated and lead us to the end of all suffering so that's enough for me so please adjust your posture however you wish and the buddha never said it was important to sit full lotus under a tree. (laughs) Of course, this was the way in ancient India, but even he had a little uh, grass cushion that he sat on and made himself at ease. So posture is not so important as long as you feel relatively alert and also comfortable. So really taking your time to settle into your body, settle into your posture and come in contact with yourself. Recognising that mindfulness that you establish in the beginning is already a quality of the awakened mind. And suffusing that mindfulness, that awareness with warmth, with kindness, with compassion. So the mindfulness knows what is happening. 
And the role of kindness is to care. So if at this stage you find that there are any aches or pains, maybe tightness in your clothing or limbs pressing into each other, then do please make those necessary adjustments out of kindness to yourself. body to relax. Recognizing that this is a time where you're not being measured, you're not being judged. You don't have to live up to your own expectations or anyone's expectations of you. You're simply offering yourself an opportunity to go inside, to be quiet, to enjoy some peace as a gift to yourself. Ah, maybe taking a deep breath. Sighing out, relaxing any tension, landing, just landing in your body, landing in the here and now. Relaxing the area around your brow. Your jaw. Maybe parting the teeth or the lips. Relaxing your shoulders. Letting the ground take all of your weight. And if you wish to follow this invitation, I'd like to invite you to imagine that you're in the presence of the Buddha. Whether you can relate to the Buddha as a person or just as those qualities that he represents. You might be sitting some distance away and the Buddha is meditating close by. Perhaps you're sitting with a group of people. A 
And the Buddha is teaching the Dhamma. And you notice there's a great atmosphere of deep peace. And you start to sense the great compassion, the way the Buddha regards you with kindly, sympathetic, non-judgmental eyes. Concerned only for your well-being. and confident that you too have the capacity for awakening. Knowing with deep wisdom that you have the capacity to understand and realize the Dhamma just as he did. And his confidence in you starts to generate that recognition within yourself of your own goodness. Your own compassion, wisdom and peace. And you might notice an uplift in the heart, a gladdening of the heart. That helps to energize the mind.
and suffusing your awareness, your mindfulness with kindness, with joy. We start to come in contact with our body and suffuse this kind awareness from the head to the toes. Coming in contact with any sensations you experience on the top of the head, throughout the scalp, across the face, as though the sun was soaking through each and every cell. from the skin right through the body. Spreading down the neck and shoulders. Releasing, relaxing any tension. And spreading down through the arms and hands. Just receiving any experience that manifests for you. with the compassionate, non-judgmental eyes of a Buddha who understands this is just the way things are. Soaking through your chest the rib cage, the belly, and all the organs within. Spreading down your back, noticing each part of the back all the way down to the hips, the buttocks, leaving no part untouched. of tightness, tension, pain, maybe as a result of some disease or injury, then suffuse those areas with extra warmth and care, the way a mother would soothe a hurting child. This kind awareness spreads at its own speed 
through the thighs. Deep inside to the tissues, the muscles, all the way to the bones. Just receiving any sensation with kindness, patience, understanding. For all that arises, passes away. Feeling into your knees, just receiving any sensation, maybe different sensations, tightness, throbbing, heat, maybe tingling. Maybe some areas you don't feel any sensations at all. Just accepting. Remaining at peace with every experience. Relating to whatever you experience with a wise, compassionate attitude. Moving all the way in your own time to the ankles, the soles, the bridge of the feet. And to each and every toe, filling up each toe with kind awareness. Coming more and more deeply into the here and now. Once your body is relaxed, noticing the quality of your mind, just relating to your mind, your inner world. Thoughts, emotions, maybe silence, maybe peace, relating to all the mental contents with kindness. With wisdom. Knowing none of this belongs to me.
And as your mind quietens, just staying with the peace. Allowing your mind to rest wherever it wishes, with the body or with the breath. Just inclining to simplicity and to peace. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. I'd just like to share any peace, any softening of the heart, any happiness we've developed for the benefit of all beings. May I be happy. Peaceful and free. May all beings be happy. Experience deep, unshakable peace. and be free from all suffering. So, I hope that people have landed and enjoyed their meditation. <laughs> Even if you don't enjoy your meditation, you can still trust that when you incline your mind in wholesome ways, it will bring benefits, whether now or later, that you may not expect. 
It never goes according to our timeline, of course. <laughs> That's what you can be sure of. <laughs> okay.